I would like to speak today concerning the topic of angels. Angels are very important to Christians life. I know that at Hungry Gen we hear about deliverance from demons but angels are mentioned more than demons. Angels, are, angels in the Bible are mentioned over 273 times in 34 books of the Bible. Angels are spiritual beings who assist God especially in His work of salvation, conveying His word to human beings and attending to the needs of God's people. Angels are called sons of God five times in the Old Testament. It's interesting because in the New Testament you are called sons and daughters of God. And so Jesus even said, He says, in heaven we will be like angels. We will, we will not be angels but we will be like angels. I call them our uh, spiritual uh, stepsisters or brothers or uh, well they don't have gender so um, but they're part of God's spiritual family right now and then we are part of God's redeemed family and one day we're going to be all together. They're powerful beings, they're used by God uh, to accomplish His purpose. The reason why I want to address the topic of angels is because as Christians we have some misconceptions about angels that I want to address today in this message. Also for those of you who are maybe checking out Christianity and you're visiting us today as a guest, you're welcome. Or watching us, you're welcome as well. There's an obsession with angels in our culture. There's angel conferences, there's angel cards, there's angel calendars, there's angel shirts. There is very huge emphasis on spirit guides, angels. I remember I met with the top YouTuber in the area of makeup. If I mention her name, every girl will know her and she recently just gave her life to Christ. And you know, even as she gave her life to Christ, she still was, you know, going through some of those um, renewing of the mind concerning angels. But before she gave her life to Christ, she had a spirit guide, an angel that was guiding her, instructing her. She showed us videos of how this angel would communicate with her. I mean very spiritual uh, person who is very famous YouTuber. And in our culture there is an obsession with angels. If you go to any kind of a spirit section in Barnes and Nobles you will see a lot of different books on how to talk to your angels, how to invoke your angel, how to get your angel to do what you need to be done in your life. In fact the religion of Islam, Jehovah Witnessism and also the religion of uh, Mormonism, the, the cult of Mormonism all was started with an angel. An angel showed up, gave a revelation and then this revelation led to the beginning of the new religion. The Bible says a lot about angels. As I mentioned, they serve God's purposes, they help with salvation and with all of that. The Bible says angels have their own food. They have their own language. We know that they are God's secret agents. I think it was Billy Graham coined that phrase is they're God's secret agents. If you remember when Elijah was with his servant and Elijah was not scared at all and his servant was freaked out and when God opened their eyes they saw an army of angels that they were there, they were just not aware of them. I truly believe every person in this room has experienced an interaction or a ministry of angels, just most of us are not aware of it. Sometimes people go in through a grieving season or through loneliness and felt wings or like the hands of somebody wrapping around them. And that's most likely angels. Sometimes maybe you were in some kind of a dangerous situation or you were about to get a car accident and someone like stopped that. That's most likely the work of angels. Angels don't always leave their feathers behind when they help you. Okay, not that I believe they have feathers or wings, but they don't have to make their presence known because their goal is make sure that you worship Jesus. Not make sure that you get interested, interested or obsessed with them. Now as Christians, our passion is for the presence of Jesus. Not for the presence of angels. We love angels, okay. We welcome the ministry of angels, but we are passionate like Moses. When Israel was stubborn and God came and says, you know what, I'm not going to go with you to the promised land. You guys are stiff-necked people. He says, I, I can't take it, you guys anymore. And I will send my angel and he will take you to the promised land. And Moses didn't say, well, <laughs> cool beans, awesome. Give us a book on how to interact with him and we're good to go. See, Moses wasn't interested in the promised land as much as he was interested in the presence. And he wasn't interested in just substitution of God's presence. He says, God, I want you. And if your presence doesn't go with us, he's like, we don't want the angel. And so I want us to know as Christians, as we have the presence of God. And we are passionate for the presence of God. But with that said, let's learn a little bit about the ministry 
of angels. This will not be comprehensive where we will go through every single detail, but I believe just the basics. The first one is this, angels are not like demons. They don't roam around the earth looking somebody to help. So many people have the view of angels as this, God just dumped them on earth and they're just like flooding right now looking just who can they help. Kind of like demons are going around whom they can hurt. Angels are the same way just whom they can help. But the Bible doesn't teach us that. The Bible actually speaks very clearly that angels have an assignment and a job. They're not roaming around looking for someone to help. Angels have an assignment and their assignments, they're about four main ones. Number one assignment is their worshipers. Therefore angels, they worship. The Bible says that angels, they worship. Angels, uh, there's even an instruction, all his angels worship him. When, one, when a servant of God, John, wanted to worship an angel, the messenger, he says, don't do that because worship belongs to God. I'm just your servant and I am not someone worthy of worship. As an angel, you and I were called to worship too. Amen. We're called to worship. Part of our service every single week that we take is we worship. And maybe some of you, that's the part that you're like, man, I hope we skip through this so I can listen to the teaching. I can get to the meat of the word. I want to remind you, your first assignment, you were called out of darkness into His light to declare His marvelous name, to declare His marvelous power. You were created to worship. I want you to get comfortable with worship. I want you to renew your mind with worship. Those of you who are stiff-necked and your hands go like this, and maybe those of you who are men and you feel too dignified to lift your hands, open up your mouth and to sing, even though if you can't keep a tune, but you still should sing because you were created to worship. Worship is not something to be done by the worship team. They're leading us, but everybody else from the back to the front, from the left to the right, from the young to the old, from those who are musically inclined, and for those of you that have had an elephant stepped on your ear, you should worship. <laughs> myself included. I'll assign myself to that group. We should worship. I remember one time the worship team had to tell me to tone it down. They're like, you're, you're coming into the recording from the front pew and you're not singing in the, in the right key what can I do? <laughs> you know, worship. So angels worship. One of the things that we will see in heaven as we will worship with angels. Sometimes we will experience that during a worship setting like this where you will worship and you will hear angels sing. It's normal because they sing and they worship and we should do the same. We should worship. The second ministry of angels is not only they worship but they war, meaning they are warriors. They fight. Angels are not pacifists. Angels are not these kind of like spineless snowflake spiritual beings. No wonder every time they would show up, the first reaction of everyone who encountered them were freaked out. And the first thing angels would say, don't be scared. So for those of you who angel just comes in and he just put a lot of lotion, his like hands are so smooth and everything, like you've been watching too much Hollywood. Angels are rough. Angels are tough. Angels are strong. One angel came and the whole Assyrian army was gone. One angel. It will be an angel who will take a chain and bind that devil. It will be angels that will pour out the bowls of God's wrath, blow the trumpets of God that will bring chaos on this earth. Angel came to Herod who was like, oh there is nobody like me, I'm God. Angels like, yeah I don't know about that. And Herod is dead. So for those of you who think that angels are just like, you know, they just flow, they just help the little children. That's not just all that they do. They're warriors. They're strong. They're mighty. The Bible says they excel in strength. Now as a Christian, you're also a warrior. Ah. You are a warrior in the kingdom of God. You are a soldier in the army of God. Now if you're a baby Christian, you're still learning, but even as a baby Christian, you're still a soldier in God's army. Bible says, the Bible says we have a sword in our hand. The Bible says we have the spiritual armor. Paul says to Timothy, be strong in the Lord and as a good soldier endure suffering. As a church, we're not just an audience of weaklings, wimps and spineless Christians. We are an army and our banner is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We are fearless. We're not afraid of antichrist. We're not afraid of death. 
we're not afraid of what's to come why because we are warriors and as warriors we overcome that fear we're courageous amen you know when I think of a warrior I think of sister Anne she's in her church she's a retired older lady this would be a good time to start you know planning for your departure but in our church you know when you retire you refire you you have to be renewed to this is the Bible says where you're going to be fruitful and bear much fruit and so many people are testifying when they call it they're calling our church phone line that that sister Anne you know takes them through deliverance and they experience deliverance because she's a warrior being a warrior has nothing to do with have being tough in in your personality you don't have to have military experience to be a spiritual warrior to be a warrior simply means you know who you are in Christ and that everything that comes against you you take it as a soldier soldiers are tough now that doesn't mean they're they're tough to the civilians it just means they're tough in their in their character they can take it they can take it and so when stuff comes to you like don't be this spineless weakling snowflake just like Ugh. no just be, be tough be tough come on somebody hard times they don't last but tough people they do I'm not saying that there's no room for crying. I'm not saying there's no room for like letting God, <laughs> spilling all of your beans to God. I'm not saying there's no room for that. But if that's all you do every single day, come on, be a warrior. Become a stronger sol soldier. Not within yourself, but within the power of Christ that resides in you. Amen. The third thing that angels do is that angels are messengers. So they're worshipers, they are warriors, and then they are messengers. It's one of the main things that angels do in the Bible. They announce things. They announce the birth of Samson. They announce the birth of John, the John the Baptist. They announce the birth of Christ. They announce things. Uh, they gave directions to Cornelius of where to find Apostle Peter. The Bible even says in Galatians that angels, if an angel preaches different gospel, that indicates angels can preach the gospel. Now I know it's commonly said, you know, God didn't tell the angels to preach. Yes, He didn't tell them to preach, but sometimes they pick up our slack. That's why in Revelation it says there's an angel who will preach the eternal gospel. And so angels, they pronounce things, they announce things, they speak of things. And that's something we all need to learn from our spiritual family. And that is we are given the same responsibility to preach. To preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to tell other people. And to preach the gospel, you don't need a microphone, you just need a voice, you need an influence. And you have that influence. I understand sometimes our youngsters on the stage, you know, scream and, and yell very loud. You know, God make everybody an apostle. That's not really God's goal. Is to make everybody an apostle. Okay, or like prophets, pro You can actually be a voice in the business, in media. You can be in your job. You don't need to have the position, the title, the calling, or the full-time benefits of an apostle to be a voice to your generation. You can be a YouTuber, a TikToker. You can be a stay-at-home mom or like Zach kept, kept mentioning moms and janitors. I was like, why is it in one sentence? Just, uh, janitors and, and moms. But I think he has some reason. Maybe it's to be a mom is, is, is as hard as being a janitor. I don't know. But whatever position that you're in, a teacher, a firefighter, in politics, you can be a voice and be a messenger in that area. When I was young, like very young, about 14 years of age, there was this lady that prophesied to me in Seattle, old lady. This is a prophecy I will never forget. As David mentioned, there's some things that you just, they, they get like lodged in your memory. And for me, spiritually, this was one of them. Um, this, this lady came to me after the service and she, mean, like Russian prophets, they're very mean. Like this is not American prophets. American prophets are like too nice. Russian prophets like on the other side, okay? <laughs> it's like, like absolutely no like uh, high by nothing. Just she grabs my hand. I'm 14 year old. She grabs my hand. She didn't take. She grabs my hand and she pulls me to herself. I thought my, my shoulder is going to come out of my joints. And she looks at me with these fierce eyes like she's mad as hell. And she looks at me and this is like, uh, I'm scared now. And she said, I saw a vision and now I'm really scared. 14 years of age and she says I saw a vision in the vision I saw a trumpet in your mouth and instead of noise coming out of your mouth I saw a fire coming out of your mouth and she says don't be afraid you will prophesy and she just walks away no by nothing no prayer just like psh, walks away let you storm storm out and I was like and I'm standing there like somebody just electrocuted me but 
I remember now this week I was telling my wife and I said it's interesting how what, what does the trumpet do? The trumpet amplifies your voice. It amplifies the sound. One of the reasons you see that the YouTube, the books that God has granted me to write touch other people. It started when I was 14 where God prophesied that my mouth will be amplified. A lot of pastors God uses them to impact the local church. The, the pastors here at Hungry Gen, it's not because we're better. I think it's just God for some reason in His sovereign grace chose that a long time ago. God wants us to be messengers. God wants us to carry His message because in carrying His message people can find healing and hope. This is not just any kind of news. This is not just any kind of gossip or a rumor. That message has power. The Bible says that the preaching of the gospel is life. It's, it's, it's power of God that is flows through that. And so angels are messengers and God has called each one of us to be messengers. Be a messenger this week. Be a warrior this week. Be a worshiper this week. But there's one more assignment that angels have is ministry. They're ministers. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 it says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So angels, not only they are messengers, not only they're worshipers and warriors, but they're also ministers. Before full-time ministry, before serving at the church, before planning center and you know choosing your where you're gonna serve, all of that, angels have their own system. They are ministers. They're not just members of God's heavenly council, they are ministers of God's heavenly council. Now in angels, the way they minister is they can minister deliverance. They brought deliverance to Lot. The Bible says they redeemed Jacob from all his troubles. They also brought deliverance to Daniel when he was thrown to the lion's den and the king came next morning and he says, God, oh great king, Daniel said, God sent his angel and he closed the mouths of lions. God's angel broke Peter twice out of jail. So that means if some of you are in jail, but probably they won't, will not break you out because some of us go to jail for different reasons though. Like Peter did not go there because he was speeding, okay, or because there was a warrant for his arrest. And so Peter was preaching of the gospel. So if you're hoping for an angel to break you out, you have to go for the same reason that Peter went to jail for. And so, and for most of us, at least at this time in America, that's not going to be a case. But they broke Peter out of jail. Angels also comforted Paul when he was going through a shipwreck and they said, hey, you're not going to die and everybody with you will be with you. They are ministers of deliverance. Angels also can minister provision. With Hagar, they helped her to find water. We see that Israel ate angels' food. I wonder if angels were in heaven just sharing their food and every morning Israel just had enough of food to eat. Angels, they supported Jesus when He finished the fast and right before He went to the cross, the Bible says they ministered to Him. Maybe they gave Him food. An angel of God brought food to Elijah. In other words, angels like to eat. <laughs> That's a good thing. Amen. So for those of you who think in heaven, we're just going to worship. No, we're going to have a lot of other stuff, if food included. So angels minister provision. But not only angels minister provision, angels actually help somebody to get married in the Bible. Now this is going to be very good for some of you who are you know, single, ready to mingle. You're like, man, God, assign an angel to my case. I need help, Lord. <laughs> Isaac was one of them. Isaac was a great man. Single guy, lived with his mom, lived with his dad and he, I think he get like, hit like 60 years of age already and still not married. He needed angelic help. And so Isaac was so comfortable that Abraham had to find him a wife. Like he didn't even go looking for a wife. He was like so comfortable. And so Abraham sends a servant in the house to find Isaac a wife. And I love what Abraham says. He says, God will send his angel. To help you find a wife. So for those of you who are single, I want to let you know God can send you an angel. Now God can send you an angel to help you find a wife and God can send you an angel to you can marry. Like not actually a real angel to get married but like you know a person who acts and so good looking and so amazing and treats you so good. They're like an angel. You know, I've had this case happen. I mentioned it in the first service. Um, you know, I, um, I've been responsible for quite a few marriages to have happened in our church. You know, sometimes it's, it's weird how it could happen. Like, you know, you can invite a person to come. Like, remember Daniela, who's right here. You know, I felt led to, to invite Daniela to be my assistant. And Danny came in and, you know, next thing that happens is that, 
you know, there was, I think my aunt, and I apologize for throwing this whole thing right now in front of everybody, but I started already, it's too late to back up. And then um, my aunt tried to uh, connect one of her uh, sons to uh, Daniela. So there was a whole hike thing that we had. And uh, instead, you know, Brian ended up talking to Daniela instead of my cousin. And next thing that happened, Brian leaves his coat behind and you know, then he brings the coat back or Brian brings the coat back. Somebody, it had to do with the coat. In the Bible, there was also Jacob and his coat, a lot of other stuff with coats. In this case, you know, next thing you know, now they're married. You know, it's like that it happens. Yeah. Maybe, maybe God used me as an angel. I don't know. Something, what, that's what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. We had a young lady that most of you know, she's not with us anymore. She's back in Texas, Isabella. And she was very quiet, very quiet. I, I, call, I call Isabella like a church mice. Completely quiet. You barely could hear her talk and she was just always there serving so faithful. And so one time I had David Diga, Hernandez and his team. And so I invited them to the house and I wanted to invite some of these like new members that we had on our staff to come to my house so they could just meet, you know, other people because they didn't have a lot of friends. They were so busy serving. And so as we didn't have a place to sit at the table, you know, Isabella, you know, I guess was talking to one of the David Diga's guys. I found out a few months later, they're getting engaged. And I was like, Isabella, how did that, how's that, him, you? I'm like, what, what did that happen? And she's like, at your house? The ministry of angels. God has given us that ministry to minister. And sometimes that ministry is not only casting out demons. Sometimes that ministry is helping somebody with food. Sometimes that ministry, like we have one of the men in our church, you know, who, who uh, sees a widow and he went and helped her to remodel uh, her place. That's a ministry. Angels minister practically. And so God has given us the same ministry to minister practically. And sometimes God will use you to help connect to people and they'll end up getting married and you know, they'll maybe name their children based on you. A hint. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. All right, we get the point. Angels are ministers and God has called us to minister as well. The second thing I want to highlight about angels is not only angels, I don't believe they roam around on the earth, but they are on assignment. Secondly is angels don't work, angels work on our behalf, but not at our command. As I mentioned in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 is that their ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who inherit salvation. Now one thing I would like to correct and that is this notion it mainly exists in more of um, I would call it hyper charismatic circles and some of you may see us as being those hyper charismatic circles and so um, something that I want to just kind of correct and that is when Christians begin to dispatch angels. Now it's a very common practice in some circles and especially intercessors or people who are very spiritually deep or people who are um, doing deliverance, they feel like, you know, God has given us power to dispatch angels. The challenge with that notion that we can command angels is actually not scriptural. The Bible is very clear that Christians are given authority over demons, but not over angels. In fact, when Moses talks about their deliverance from Egypt, he says, God sent his angel and delivered us from Egypt. We see that Lot was telling angels, hey, I don't want to go. They didn't say, oh yeah, okay. No, the Bible says they grabbed them and say, you're going. So Lot didn't command angels. It, Daniel, when he was in the, in the cave over there and the lion was there, Daniel didn't say, oh yeah, I was here and I just dispatched my angel. He shut off the lions. No, he says, God sent an angel. When Peter was in jail, the Bible says that the Lord, that they prayed to God and then God sent an angel. You don't see the church saying, God, we dispatched the angel of prison break out to reach Peter. We dispatched seven angels. You know, they didn't, we don't see them doing that. In fact, even the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 26 verse 53, and this threw me off because Jesus is the commander of the angels. Jesus is the, is the commander of the Lord's armies and it says, Jesus spoke to his disciples. He says, do you think that I cannot now pray to my father that he will provide me with more than 12 legion of angels? The only being who actually had the authority to dispatch them, he tells his disciples, he says, I can pray to my father to dispatch those angels. So what does that mean? That means angels don't work for you. They work for him. Angels don't work for us. They belong to our father. He has them on the payroll and he tells them what to do. 
The scripture says they hearken to the voice of the Lord. It does not say they hearken to the voice of the believers. Now we are given authority over demons but angels are not demons. We're not given the authority over angels. So when you're involved in deliverance and it's pretty common right now and it's pretty cool where deliverance ministers, not that it's necessary but it feels like everybody wants to do this so that they can kind of brag about the fact that angels obeyed them what they did. So when you're doing deliverance and it gets a little bit tough and you know you're like I just command an angel to come on the right and on the left. Now it, and it's pretty sexy in the area of deliverance but it's not necessary. It's not necessary. Why? You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. Like I know it makes you feel better. Oh the Holy Spirit's not enough but I got like two angels. So first of all you ain't got any angels. They're His angels. What you were given and I was given is the authority over demons. Now does that mean that we cannot ask the Father to, to send His angels to help us with assistance? Yes, but He also has sent the Holy Spirit. Like did the Holy Spirit run out of power that we're like right now we just need backup. Like the Holy Ghost needs a backup. Not really. So can angels help during deliverance? Of course. But not one deliverance in the Bible you will see where angels were involved. So I don't think it's necessary or makes a rule or the moment I have a problem with and instead of increasing our fasting and prayer we're like no let me just step into this like pow dispatch an angel, dispatch a legion. You're not a general sunshine, you're a believer. And so just, just stick within the realm of your authority and let God dispatch angels at His will. And we can command demons as the Lord commands us to command them. Amen? Yes. Number four, number three, I apologize. Some angels are assigned to a place but not to a person. From the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, we see that when God kicked, angel, uh, when God kicked Adam and Eve out of Eden, He placed an angel to guard a place. So some angels, guardian angels, I believe in guardian angels. I just don't think they guard individuals. Now I'm going to explain why. Guardian angels, some angels have a place to guard. We see this in Genesis chapter 3. They were guarding a garden of Eden. When Daniel, an angel came to Daniel and he identified himself as the one that was guarding the nation of Israel. And so we see that angels can guard places. When it comes to the idea that every Christian has an angel, it's not necessarily in the Bible. Like some people believe that every baby, the moment you get born, God gives you an angel like America gives you Social Security. You know, the moment you become an American or if you're born in America, what's one thing you get? You get the Social Security number. Yeah. When I came to the United States, I got blessed. I got two Social Security numbers. Okay, and for those of you who are maybe looking for a Social Security number, I'm sorry, my second one is not for sale yet. But for some weird reason, ever since I applied for my credit card at the age of 15 or 16, they used a different social security number. And then when I tried to reconcile, it turns out I have two social security numbers. I've reached out to the social security office and asked them to put them into one. And they're like, honestly, there's, there's nothing that they could do. And I, so I thought maybe I'm stealing somebody else's. Maybe they made a mistake and it's somebody else. They're like, no, there's two of them. So I have an alias. My original name is Vladimir. I go by other name, Vlad. <laughs> and uh, two different identities. That's what they gave me. But when you are born as a Christian, born again, God did not give you an angel. He gave you His Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the verse that we have used to make ourselves feel better about the idea that we all got angels guarding us. And the verse is in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 10. Now the first time that this came clean to me, I was very disappointed by the way. So for those of you who might feel disappointed, join the club. Join the club. <laughs> Take heed that you do not despise one of the little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels, plural, their angels always see the, the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now at first it does seem like their angels, meaning there's angels that belong to them. Until you read in the full verse you understand if you have an angel that is guarding you here on earth, then we have two problems. One of them, why are these angels in heaven? And why are they not looking at you but they're looking at the Father? Come on, if you're working for security, if you're a watchman at Hungry Gen, you know one thing is you have to be at the place where you're guarding. 
Secondly is you have to look at the people that you're protecting. But these so-called guardian angels that supposedly we all have, they're not even here with us. They are in heaven constantly looking at the face of the Father. Now since I mentioned other verses, it would make sense. Why? Because they're waiting for that instruction from Him. They're not waiting for you to mess up, you to get into any problem because God the Spirit lives inside of you. But at the particular time, God can dispatch them as they are looking for direction from Him. Could they be assigned to you specifically? Maybe. We don't have that in the Bible. Maybe not. But one thing is they're not with you. They're in there. And they're looking at His face. Waiting for an instruction from Him to help you. Now, obvious question. Well, if God the Spirit lives inside of me, why does He need angels? Very good question. The same reason is, if God the Spirit brings people to salvation, why does He need us to preach the gospel? God does not need angel. He chooses to involve them. And God does not need you and I. He chooses to involve us. He chooses to do deliverance with us. He chooses to bring other people into salvation through us. He doesn't need us. He chooses to involve us. It's like a father who, you know, maybe does some lawn work and he can do it by himself way faster. And then he involves his little children who will only make a big mess and make the project three times longer and probably more expensive. But why would the father go through all of the trouble? Because he wants the kids to be involved. He wants them to feel like they did it together and afterwards, you know, he will say, we did it. Even though the only thing they did is nothing. <laughs> but we still say, we did it. Why? Because there's a sense of dignity, sense of even identity, relationship that is being cultivated. God is interested knowing it's going to take longer, knowing that we're going to make so many mistakes to involve. Now angels are a lot better than us, but us, we're a lot slower than angels. But God still chooses to involve us. Yeah. On this earth. So when you feel like, man, why does God want me to talk to my neighbor about God? It's a privilege. God could zap your angel with electricity instantly. God chooses to involve you. It's a privilege. God sees as a privilege to involve us in what He's doing in partnership. Amen. So angels are assigned to certain places, but they're mainly looking at the face of the Father in heaven and waiting for His command. And the last thing that I want to mention is the church is the university of angels where every believer is a professor. First Peter chapter 1 verse 12. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. On Monday I started my uh, my my degree in, um, in a Bible seminary and so now I have things that I'm looking, not, not necessarily looking forward to, but studying concerning theology and concerning the Bible and one of the reasons I decided to go back to college, well actually not go back to college because I never went to college, <laughs> go to college, um, was because I know what the future of our church is going to be and I know that God's going to be bringing a lot of people that are intellectuals, people that are educated and though predominantly uh, the the majority of our church is blue collar, hard working uh, people. But I know that where God is taking us, it will require certain change on my part. And I had to improve in that area as well. And plus I want to learn and I want to study. Angels also are in school. The Bible says this is what they desire to look into. They know things you and I one day to dream of seeing like the face of God. They've been around the throne of God. They know what it's like to go through from one place to another in a split second. They've seen the power of God that one day we only will see. They've seen Jesus. They've seen the Holy Spirit. But there's one thing that angels have not had an experience of. There's one thing that angels cannot say that you and I can say. I was lost and now I am found. I was blind and now I see. I was far from Christ but now I am brought near by the blood of Jesus. Because the angels that got lost don't get found. They don't have a chance to come back. God never given them an, has given them an offer of redemption. So they've seen in their spiritual family some angels went rogue. 
And God didn't extend mercy. In fact, we see in that verse that is used to describe the fall of angels that Michael, they, the Michael, one of the top angels in heaven just kicked him out. You don't see God the Father going back and say, hey yo, you guys sure you want to do this? Uh, like I'll give you a second chance. Do you, you want to maybe come back? Do you want to talk about it? No, they're gone. They're so evil now. They're so corrupt. Though they were never made like that. They're bent on doing evil. They follow the rulership and dictatorship of their, their leader, the devil, Lucifer, and that bad being. And they were never given a chance of forgiveness. I think angels are still puzzled. Why were the humans given the chance? What makes them so different? They were never in heaven in the first place. So the, it's not like they've seen more or had a greater exposure to the spiritual realm. We haven't. We lived on this earth. I mean, Elon Musk is trying to get us to some other planets. But other than that, we, we've been here. We haven't lived more than 60, 70, 80 years of age. What makes us so special? I think that's what angels are looking into. Trying to figure out what makes them so special. Like these guys, they're, they're connected to the law of gravity. They can float in the air. They can fly. They, they walk on the ground. Like they're, they're a little bit crazy. They're a little bit annoying. And they're, I mean, they're just, they have all these problems. They fight at each, with each other. They, they, they hurt each other. They, they, they don't even know that God created them. Some of them are so educated that they believe God doesn't exist. Some of them feel like it's a reason to hate God because they can't explain things like why bad things happen to good people. Oh, I'm rejecting Jesus. Why? Because the Bible says, you know, homosexuality is sin. That must that's it. I, I can't take Christianity anymore. And they look at that and they're like, humans are weird. Why does God love them? Like, why did He give them a second chance? Why did He go as far as to let His Son take their place and die for them? The Bible says that angels desire to study. They're in university right now. And guess who their professors are? Every believer who's been washed. Not by the blood, by the blood of the archangel. Not by the blood of an angel, but by the blood of the Lamb. So their boss became your substitute. Their boss took my place on the cross. Their boss became like me, not like an angel, even lower than an angel, became just like me. He walked on this earth. He let rebels like me crucify him, nail him to the cross, pierce his heart on the cross that water and blood came out and then bury him in the tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead and he still is so interested in these humans that now he keeps dispatching angels. He sends the Holy Spirit. He sends the church. He seems to love them so much that when they get saved, angels who don't understand completely why is God doing, like why humans, like out of all the species, humans, they get this second chance God takes their evil, callous heart, darkened heart, just like the demons. He takes it and He transforms it. They go from an addict to a believer. They go from darkness to light. They become good. Not because they went through a 12-step program. That 12-step program realized, helped them to realize that they need an, a being to help them. But because of the power of the grace of God. And angels look at that and they're, they're amazed and they're looking into the gospel. My friend, it's a privilege to experience this gospel. It's even greater privilege to share this gospel. Yes, yes. This is what angels are fascinated about. What you and I take for granted. I'm fascinated about how everything's in heaven. That's what fascinates me. I'm fascinated with the throne. I'm fascinated with God's face. It's not that they're not fascinated with that because God is worthy of fascination for eternity. But they desire to look into that which you and I are recipient of. Yeah, come on, come on. The gospel. The good news. Maybe you're here today and you have not received this good news yet. You're receiving it now. It would be so not good to reject the offer of your Creator who took your place. He doesn't want anything from you. He wants you. 
your heart is callous without him it's it's hard it's hardened and you know it you don't have to, you don't have to be a religious thing to know you're capable of stupid <laughs> and on steroids like a lot of stupid mm -hmm. you don't have to be religious nobody has to convince you that you are a sinner all we have to do is just look at our life look at within us we have that we know that we carry that nature of that devil because we followed his rebellion but there is God he doesn't wait for you to change you remodel yourself salvation is not you trying harder it's not you rehabilitating yourself it's not external modification where you change cosmetics and you you make yourself look better stop cursing stop cussing throw away the drugs stop sleeping with your boyfriend and you know throw away the all of this the witchcraft and now you can be like Lord I'm good for you now no that's not that it's a heart transformation that's done by by him not by you he starts that work he continues that work and he keeps on working and all you got to do is to stay out of his way that's all really what faith is, is staying out of his way. Letting the Lord have his way. That's what salvation is and that's what Christian life is. If you think Christian life is hard, no it's not hard, it's impossible. If you do it yourself. The moment you let him in, he does the work and he continues to live through you. And the only time it gets hard is when you begin to work for him instead of letting him work through you. I want to invite you today. Maybe those of you who are coming today for the first time to Hungry Gen. And maybe you're like, man, experience is, is kind of crazy. Music is loud. The preacher's screaming. <laughs> All of this stuff. 27 people shook my hand. I don't even know if they used the sanitizer or not. <laughs> the people realize we still have a pandemic somewhere in the world in here. And, and maybe like you have all of these questions. Maybe you have a lot of things of what happened to your, your ancestors when you prayed for God and He seemed not to come through. Maybe something happened to you when you were a child and you seem to have questions. Where was God? Why did he allow that to happen? Christians seem to believe some weird, bizarre things. All of that can take a second place. What's the most important thing is this. The Bible says you are a sinner. Maybe it sounds strong and offensive, but honestly, we are. But that's not what the Bible ends. Only religion in the world where the God became man so that we can become his children. He doesn't give us forgiveness. Like Biden gave us a little card to use for $1,600. He doesn't know you, doesn't want to know you, gave you that card. It doesn't even help with much. That's not God's forgiveness. He didn't give us that card. He gave us His Son. He promises to come and live inside of you. And He says, I will take the guilt. I will take your sin. And if you get in some other trouble, I'm going to plug in my bodyguards, my angels. They will help you. I got you. You will win because I will live through you. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.